sexual world where substance doesn't matter, you know? And, and why we're so politically correct? We, we find small children for saying things to one another. We find teachers for, I don't know, touching the student on the back. We do all of that. But we really have lost the meaning of empathy. And that is another reason that stories become so important for us. Because we cannot experience everything. And we need, um, we need others to, to connect to. And stories, as the narrator in To Kill a Mockingbird tells us, makes us put on someone else's shoes and walk around in it. That is what the word empathy is. And empathy is not about difference. There are two different things. One is a celebration of others that are different from us, but we can't stop them. It is very dangerous to think of other people as just others, whether we say they're good or bad. Both of it is dangerous. You have to be able to connect. You have to understand about that common humanity that you share. And the most important thing in literature and in art is the fact that it tells you not how different we are, but how alike we are. Uh, you know, the, um, when Sh Shylock talks about if you prick us, do we not bleed? The fact is that we all bleed. I mean, if you're in Iraq and you're a mother and your children have been bombed, your heart aches in the same manner of the mother who lives in Virginia and whose son has been killed in the war. Or the mother who has been in Darfur and has been raped time and time again. Or the young girl in the jail in the Islamic Republic because of the way she looks or the way she talks or defends the human rights, who, who, who is tortured. We all feel jealousy and love and hatred. We all want a decent life for ourselves and for our children. The right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness is not an American thing. It's not a Western thing. No woman likes to be flogged or taken to a football stadium in Kabul and, and, and a good gun put to her head and, 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 and be murdered because of the fact that she looks different. So, how much time do I have? Could someone tell me? Yeah. Wow. No, no. <laughs> the reason I say this is because you talk about democracy until you get the podium, <laughs> and then you forget all about it. But start I can, as soon as I can see you, you can look at your watches. You know, because what I wanted to do now was just tell you a little bit about my experiences of Iran and of America in order to prove the points that I was trying to make. And to make a very long story short, um, I used to always uh, grumble and complain about the fact that I, you know, I was constantly uprooted from one home to another. And now I think in a sense it's blessing to be uprooted because you constantly are forced to not feel at home in your own home and to look at the world through the eyes of the others. You know, and, 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 and when I talk about the two countries that I made my home, one was the, my beloved country, Iran, the country of my birth. And, and, and you know, um, uh, it was so very strange that for years I was sent outside Iran and to study uh, at a very young age when I was 13. And, and when I left Iran at that age, I learned that the only way, I mean, I don't think that it was clear to me, but this is how I felt, I'm formulating it now, I'm sure, that, that this world is so fickle. Even if it not, it's not a war or a revolution, your parents put you in a plane and send you somewhere else. Um, there is a tornado, there is a storm, there is a hurricane. The world, the world is constantly transient. And the only way we can keep rooted in such a world is first of all to preserve the memories. And the best safeguards of memories, of course, are on the words. It is the books, it's the poetry, it's the literature, it is the history. And when I first left Iran, you know, I took with me three books of poetry, one belonging to our classical poet Hafez, the other Rumi, and the other to this very feminist uh, Persian poet 
who maybe Iranian, if they are in this room, would know who the Fanochs are. You know, and, 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 and they were my bedside books. I would look at them, and I knew then even that this is the best of the art. No one is going to take that away from me. Neither a Shah, nor an Ayatollah, nor anyone. And then the way I made my home in, uh, in England and, and later in this country was also with, through its golden em emissaries. Uh, through Jane Austen and W.H. Auden and, and, and Emily Dickinson and, and Hawthorne and, and Saul Bellow and Zora New Hurston. And, and that Republic of Imagination, the only identity cards you needed was your passion. You, you transcended the limitations of nationality, ethnicity, race, and gender and religion. And, and, and the fact was that I always tell this that in England at the time I was going, and you can look at me and tell my age, so I don't need to um, <laughs> do anything else. Uh, but at that time, um, I, uh, if you wanted to have heat, you had to put shillings in the heaters. Uh, and so if you were too close to the heater, you would burn. If you were too far from the heater, you would freeze. And I got into the habit of getting under the um, uh, blankets and with a hot water bottle. And there was a book at that time that said, um, it was about the British, how to be an alien. It was a sample of the British. And it said that continental people have sex like the British have the hot water bottle. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so that was true then. Now they have, you know, central heating. So I don't know what has happened to that. <laughs> but, um, but, but the point is that that is how I kept myself going. And, and when I went back to Iran uh, in 1979, I finished my dissertation, and two days later, I was in Iran, and I, as soon as I stepped down the airplane, the, the faces, the atmosphere, I knew that home was not home anymore. And, and, and you know, uh, I would go back to, to what I felt, and I'm always thankful for the Islamic Republic for not making me feel at home in my own home, because of the fact that you need not to be complacent. And whenever you are complacent, something bad is going to happen. And my generation was very complacent. And, 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 and you know, a lot of things we, we did not really go into the, the depth of the matter. But anyway, because um, I want to finish on time, I just wanted to say that when... Now, I will talk about the Islamic Republic and what happened. But what shocked me was when after... Um, I couldn't leave Iran uh, for 10 years, and when I first left and came here for a conference, one of the things that really shocked me, and, and I was so away from this world, was the way they would talk about Iran and the Muslim world. Now, first of all, one thing had happened. Look at these countries as different as Iran, Turkey, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, Indonesia, all of them were now reduced to one aspect, which was their religion. And that religion, Islam, even a lay person like me knows, Islam, like Judaism, like Christianity, like any other religion, has so many interpretations. And it is not, by the way, just Shia and Sunni. They love to play that nowadays. The Muslims used to be Muslims, now they're Shias and Sunnis. Muslims are like you. They are very different. Some are orthodox, some are reformist, some are used to be Muslims, now they're not, they're atheists. There are all sorts of Muslims. And if we do not accept that, if we try to make them all look alike, then no matter whether we say we're for them or against them, we're against them. Because it's a condescending view. Turkey is Turkey. It has its own thousands of years of history. Iran, Saudi Arabia, each of these countries, like Italy and France and Britain and America, that we do not call Christian countries, they are different. Imagine even in America, we say that America is a Christian majority country, and from tomorrow, all Americans will become Christians. They're all Christians. They should all wear the cross, go to church on Sunday, and follow only one Christian denomination, let's say Southern Baptist. <laughs> why not? I mean, why, why the heck not? I mean, Sarah Payne has been telling you this, you haven't been listening. But the, point, but the, point, but the point that I'm trying to make is that in this country, we won't talk 
tolerate it. But we tolerate it for them. Why should I, who was born into a Muslim family, who, whose parents believed in that religion, why should I not have as much right to define what that religion is as Mr. Ahmadinejad? Mm -hmm. So you have to understand that what is going on in Iran or in any other Muslim country, the fight is not against the religion. The fight is for freedom of choice. It is because no power on earth, no state, has the right to tell its citizens how to relate or connect to, to their God or not accept the God. That is what is at issue. But nobody talks about 